Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you for listening today. I uh, always want to remind you guys, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go snag your free 31-page PDF. It's on the top 200 drugs. Uh, it'll be a great refresher for you if it's been a while since you've been in school or uh, if you're taking pharmacology exams, board exams, it's a, a good little uh, brush-up uh, study guide to make sure you're uh, on top of some of the most important uh, clinical pearls with those drugs. So again, reallifepharmacology.com, uh, go sign up and you can snag that for free. All right, so the drug I wanted to discuss today uh, is insulin glargine, and it is a medication that I see used uh, very frequently. Obviously, insulin is going to be used in our patients with uh, type 1 and, and type 2 diabetes. And uh, brand names of, of this medication, uh, Lantus is probably the one you're going to hear most often. Uh, Basaglare is uh, kind of a newer biosimilar uh, agent. And uh, Tujeo is, is a available uh, dosage form of glargine as well. And that's uh, 300 units per mil, just a little bit different uh, variation on the uh, concentration. Uh, so these insulin or insulin glargine is a long-acting insulin, uh, sometimes uh, called a, a basal insulin, because uh, it really provides kind of a, a baseline uh, coverage of insulin. It's not meant uh, to manage acutely elevated blood sugars, okay? So it's going to basically bring down uh, blood sugars, hopefully pretty evenly, all throughout the day. So this is obviously, um, you know, advantageous in the population that I see most, your type 2 diabetes patients, where it can, you know, bring kind of the, you know, average daily blood sugar down, you know, 20 points or 40 points or whatever the, the case may be, depending upon the dose you're using and that type of thing. So again, that's going to bring that, those blood sugars down kind of all throughout the day. So it's not going to be used to uh, target a specific meal, for example. So if a patient is uh, way elevated, you know, after their supper meal, um, you know, giving uh, Lantus insulin or, or uh, glargine insulin is, is not going to bring that down um, in, in that setting or is not appropriate in that setting because you're going to crash um, all the other blood sugars as well. And I'll talk a little bit about kinetics and onset and, and that type of thing too uh, coming up here. Uh, if we are using um, basal insulin, sometimes patients uh, will use a uh, basal plus one, for instance, in, in type 2 diabetes, um, sometimes they'll, they'll do basal boluses and more often probably found in, in type 1 where we're giving a bolus dose of rapid-acting insulin uh, essentially with meals or when that, that person has uh, uh, dietary food intake, blood sugar, in blood sugar intake. So that's often called a, a basal bolus uh, type situation, and the basal is obviously going to be the glargine, and then it's you know potentially being given um, with a rapid acting uh, insulin at, at the meals. The basal insulin again only going to be typically dosed once a day. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring that up is sometimes you'll you'll see that insulin split up, or it, it will be split up into. It's usually approximately a 50-50 split where, you know, 50% of the total daily dose of, of insulin um, is going to be basal and approximately 50% uh, will come as uh, bolus in, insulin kind of divided out uh, through those meals if that's the, the way it's being given. So um, that's a, a question I've, I've definitely come across. Again, it, it's not always exactly 50-50, um, but that's kind of a, a ballpark figure for you. Uh, certainly can vary clinically, uh, depending upon the patient. Um, dose changes I wanted to mention. Um, how frequently do we uh, increase a, a dose of, let's say we've got Lantus, for example. Um, usually it's in the neighborhood of, of every three to seven days. Um, if it's not, you know, a, a crazy emergency that we need to, to get down those blood sugars, uh, you know, usually I'm I'm more in the line of, of five to seven if we can hold off that 
that long. And obviously, again, this is probably more so uh, in your type 2 diabetes patients. Um, cause again, they, they've probably had elevated blood sugars, uh, for a long, long time. So, you know, being a little bit cautious and making sure we don't get hypoglycemia, um, that's probably the route I, I prefer in, in most cases, but, um, certainly I have seen, seen folks do, uh, every three day, uh, increases as well. So again, just need to, to monitor those patients clinically, um, pay attention and, you know, that aggressiveness of increasing the dose, um, you know, you, it may necessitate more close clinical monitoring there. Uh, it is important not to, at least appropriate, not to do um, daily increases, okay? So, you know, patients monitoring blood sugars, they're still high, they're still high. Um, going up on that dose on a daily basis, uh, you do have the kind of potential to slam them or overload them um, with uh, insulin, and, and that could accumulate, uh, if we aggressively uh, increase that that dose a little bit too quickly, and then again we're we're going to raise that risk for hypoglycemia, uh, which nobody uh, nobody likes for sure. Uh, starting dose, uh, it's a question I, I've been asked before, certainly, so I wanted to mention that. Um, usually in in type two, um, I'll, I'll refer to the the patient population I see most often. Uh, type twos usually ten units is is started. Um, That can vary based upon, you know, sensitivity or previous trials or, you know, clinical decision making based upon where they are. Um, But most often I would say I see 10 units started. Um, Dosed increases, okay, how quickly or how big of an increase do do we take? So there you're looking at uh, most often, you know, recommended is in the 10 to 20% range. So if you start at 10 units and you were going to, let's say, you know, five days, week, three, five days a week has gone by and, and they're still not definitely even close to goal, um, you're probably going to look to a, a 10 to 20% increase. So that'd be one to two units. Now, as we get patients with higher and higher doses, you know, 30 to 40 units, you know, you might increase it to, you know, maybe you do two or three unit increases. So again, kind of going to depend a little bit. Um, on, you know, clinical judgment and have that hypoglycemia in the past and those type of things. Um, but a, a good kind of, you know, reference ballpark to kind of start with and think about is the 10 to 20% increases if those blood sugars aren't at goal. And obviously, if we don't have uh, much for hypoglycemia risk. Uh, side effect management. So hypoglycemia, I've been mentioning that. Uh, the other issue, you know, with with insulin kind of on a longer term basis is weight gain. Um, so that is a, a potential big problem, uh, particularly in, in patients with type 2 diabetes. They're generally uh, overweight already. So adding insulin um, can certainly increase uh, that risk of weight going up as well. Uh, conversions, uh, this is a question uh, that I have been asked, you know, different insurances will require to, to use, you know, this long acting insulin versus this product. So, uh, I, I generally always look this up if I get asked on converting one to another. Uh, with that said, uh, the majority of, uh, of, you know, or the, the ballpark, I should say, when, when we're converting is usually 80 to a one-to-one conversion, 80% to a one-to-one conversion. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a ballpark. But again, I would uh, encourage you to figure out which individual products we're going to be switching to, whether that's, you know, Levemir to Lantis or, you know, to J.O. to, to Lantis or whatever the case may be, um, that 80 to, to 100% um, or, you know, close to -to one-to-one ratio is usually where, where we're at with those. So again, look that up, make sure you got the the right conversion there. And then of course, clinically monitor that patient closely after any conversion. Okay. I've seen instances where, you know, they actually weren't using their particular product appropriately. And then they started the new medication and they did use that appropriately. And, you know, that, basically ended up in a situation where the dose was way too high. And so patients can get confused, you know, with some of these pen devices and and different things. Um, So really, really uh, pay attention in any transition uh, and ensure the patient is well-educated, not only to know what to do and and how to use it, uh, but also when to report 
things that, that are off or wrong and that type of thing so we can uh, help make a quick intervention before they get hospitalized or something bad happens. Uh, kinetics, I, I did want to touch on them briefly. So onset typically for insulin glargine is about three to four hours. Um, so as you can imagine, we're not typically going to have to to worry about hypoglycemia right away. You know, obviously, unless they were, you know, basically hypoglycemic to begin with, um, it's going to take a little while for that, you know, insulin to, to be absorbed and to uh, start uh, having its effects over time. Uh, duration of action is obviously going to be around a day. Um, it's, it's usually dosed once a day. I have seen uh, situations, uh, you know, in attempts to try to stabilize absorption, that type of thing, um, where glargine has been given uh, twice a day, particularly with, um, you know, basaglare or lantus there. Um, again, that's pretty, not a real common situation, but um, it is something I've seen tried by, by various clinicians there. How much evidence is, there is to support that, um, you know, maybe a little bit questionable, but um, with that said, duration of action is approximately 24 hours, so typically we're, we're going to be able to get away with once dosing, and, you know, that's how it was, you know, studied most often as well there. So another thing I wanted to mention was medication errors. This is something I review um, in long-term care settings, assisted living settings. Um, medication errors are obviously a big concern with insulin products. Now, with a you know uh, Lantus glargine type product, uh, that error probably isn't going to be acutely noticed, okay? Because that onset of action is several hours. Compare that to, let's say, you give a, a rapid-acting insulin like Humalog, and you give that, and a an error is made with administration in that. You're going to see that issue within 15 minutes, half hour, hour for sure. Um, so that that's an important thing to to think about. And I have seen errors where you know patient is on two different insulins, the the you know basal or long-acting insulin and a rapid-acting insulin, and I have seen them switched and. Uh, if the rapid acting is given in place of the long acting, obviously where that patient is going to be in uh, at a bunch of risk right away within the first half hour hour of um, dropping dropping blood sugars and, and hypoglycemia. So uh, again, really really important to to recognize the high risk nature of of insulin in general, um, and obviously the utmost care needs to be taken with these products. But it also helps to understand. Uh, the pharmacology and the pharmacokinetics uh, surrounding these medications in recognizing what's going to happen uh, to that patient's patient and, and when uh, blood sugars are, are likely to uh, go down and, and when they may come back up as well. Uh, monitoring parameters, uh, A1C and blood sugars, obviously what we're going to be focusing on most there. Um, it's not something I would say I, I worry about uh, to a great extent, with especially with the longer-acting insulins. Um, but remember that uh, insulin is used as an option to treat acute hyperkalemia. Okay, so that is important to remember, and and there is potential there uh, that you know potassium could be thrown off a little bit. Again, with the longer-acting insulins, you know the slower onset. You know, usually the body has time to compensate. It's not an issue, um, but that, that is a good thing to remember with uh, insulins in, in general is that they do um, bring down uh, the uh, serum potassium levels. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like pharmacotherapy, medication therapy management, ambulatory care, geriatrics, psychiatry, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. If you're another healthcare professional, nurse, physician, med student, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a great list of, of Amazon books, Audible books. Uh, always remember you can get your first Audible book for free. So I've got books that are uh, between six and eight hours long that you can absolutely get for free if you've never tried Audible uh, before. So again, go check out all those links, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, finishing up drug interactions. 
Uh, I typically don't worry too much about drug interactions with insulin. Um, reason being is you're likely going to be monitoring these patients when you make insulin changes. So, um, the, the one exception is when we maybe add a new medication onto insulin that either might potentiate the effects of, of lowering blood sugar or potentially mask the symptoms of something like hypoglycemia. So some medications that I, I think about, obviously, you know, if a patient's on diabetes medications already and we add insulin, we start insulin onto that regimen, uh, they may be a little bit more at risk for hypoglycemia. So any patient taking diabetes medications and we start insulin, uh, we, we've got to be really uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, hypoglycemia uh, could certainly happen here. So your metformins, your uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1s, uh, pioglitazone, all those drugs uh, may potentiate that risk for hypoglycemia when used in combination. Now in practice, they are used in combination. Uh, Lantus, for example, is, I see it all the time with metformin. So they are used together, but it's important to, to recognize when we make changes in those, um, they could kind of potentiate each other's effects a little bit there. Um, quinolone antibiotics are, are a drug that I have seen kind of throw off or, or alter blood sugars at times, uh, masking hypoglycemia, beta blockers, and that risk. Um, thiazide diuretics are thrown out there occasionally um, in the fact that they might potentially raise blood sugars. Um, I don't think they're that significant, clinically significant uh, in most situations and at the doses that we're, we're often using with thiazides there. Uh, corticosteroids, yes, absolutely can raise blood sugars and uh, really oppose the effects of what we're trying to do with insulin and in lowering the blood sugars, uh, antipsychotics, transplant drugs uh, like cyclosporin and tacrolimus, um, and stimulants are another example of drugs that may kind of raise blood sugars and kind of counteract the, the benefits of, of insulin there. So I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, found a, a nugget or two that you liked, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, greatly appreciative to those of you who have done that. Uh, if you want to support this podcast, definitely go to meded101.com slash store, and uh, you can check out our whole list of uh, Amazon books, resources uh, for board certification, and, and all that good stuff. So uh, again, I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, take care. Have a great rest of your day.